Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Last lecture we de, uh, deduced essentially uh, largely on the board free John or the John multiplier conditions. Here you can see the application of the Gordon's theorem of the alternative, which leads to the John multiplier rule or the free John multiplier rule, whatever you want to say. Of course, there are a lot of things has to be said about this normal multipliers, abnormal multipliers, examples must come, but we are going to first give you a brief outline about how this proof came about in the sense that the crux of the proof is the application of the Gordon's theorem of the alternative and it is very important at this stage to know the, how do you actually prove the Gordon's theorem of the alternative. If I, so, here I guess we did not uh, use the Gordon's theorem, write down the Gordon's theorem of the alternative. So, let me tell you uh, the key to the Gordon's theorem, Gordon's alternate theorem of the alternative T to the Gordon's theorem of the alternative is the separation theorem of convex sets i have a series of lectures in the same NPTEL set of a series of lectures i have a series of lect 40 lectures on convex optimization and i think the 7th or 8th lecture would contain the separation theorem for convex sets where the thing has been done in absolute details, but here because we have lot of other pressing details, lot of other things to do and so here instead of getting too much into the issues of convex analysis, we would rather uh, give a brief outline of what is the separation theorem and uh, that would be enough for you to get an idea about how these things are used and ok. Let us uh, look into the issue of separation theorems. That brings us to some important convex sets. So, these are already there in the other lecture, but I am just giving uh, recalling rather. So, first important the first important convex set is the hyperplane. So, hyperplane is a set of all H a set of all X in R n which satisfies an equality of the form this. So, this A and B which A which is in R n and B which is in R. So, these two determine the hyperplane, you can in fact write hyper H A B, many authors do so. So, this is a, a definition of a hyperplane, this hyperplane is a convex set. Typical examples of hyperplane in the two dimensional case is a straight line, this is a hyperplane. Of course, you can understand these straight lines are written as A x plus B y equal to C. So, it is inner product of A B with x y equal to C and another in R 3 typical example is the plane. Where you usually the equation is written as this is the equation of the plane. 
So, that is uh, the idea. So, now this hyperplane or straight line you can see is dividing the plane R2 into two parts. This is one half space, this is another half space, this is upper part, this is a lower part. So, this leads to two more two more convex sets associated with the hyperplane. One is called the upper half space, which is you can write like this or give some invent your you can invent your same symbols. So, once you know this, you should uh, then it is set of all x element r n such that. So, this is usually referred to as upper half plane and then there is the lower half plane. So, these are all half planes. Find all the set of all x which this. So, this which satisfies these two. So, of course, the only intersection point between upper and lower half space is the hyperplane. So, H is now of course, you could put strict inequality and strict inequality here to get the interior of the hyperplanes right. They are called the strict upper half plane, uh, strict upper half space, and strict strict lower half space. The idea behind the separation is uh, very interesting in the sense it says that if you take two convex sets which are not intersecting, one is C1 and another is C2. and what is given to you is C 1 intersection C 2 is phi. Then you can always find an hyperplane which can be drawn in such a manner such that the set C 1 is in one half space and the set C 2 is in other half space. This is always true when you have two convex sets which do not intersect, but this fact cannot be said about non convex sets, which is uh, of course, you can have a non convex set like this, you can have another non convex set like this, which are not intersecting C 3, C 4. Of course, you can say, oh, I can draw a straight line like this. Of course, that is all right, you can do it, but you cannot do it for every such situation where you can do it for every such situation in a convex case. Here, for example, if you take this set. A set which is very important in multi objective optimization, if there are more than one constraints. So, this is a set W which is R2 minus sorry R2 set minus minus int R2 plus. So, leaving this part in the interior of this sec third quadrant, everything else is considered in W. Now, W intersection minus int R 2 plus is phi. Now, you cannot draw any hyperplane where minus interior R 2 is in one side and this whole thing is in the other side. So, here the things are broken by these are these two are this is this, this is the convex set. Well, this is a non convex set, this is non convex, not convex, and this is convex. So, so what are the essential separation theorems? So, essential separation theorems are as follows. Uh, first case is you take a closed convex set C which need not be bounded and a point takes outside it C closed and convex and 
and x not in C. Then the conclusion is then there exists a hyperplane strictly separating them. Let me tell you what that does it mean. Means you can draw a hyperplane whose in whose strict half spaces C lies in and whose other strict half space X lies. That is none of them are on the boundary. Right? This hyperplane does not contain any point from any of these two sets. That is what is the meaning of strict separation. So, this is one thing. Now, this is the first and the basic result. And the second result is C 1 and C 2 are two convex sets. C 1 is compact, C 2 is closed. is C 1 and this C 2 with the fact that C 1 and C 2 do not intersect. Now, compactness here becomes a very essential thing, because now we say that if this happens we can do strict separations, strict separation possible. We can say that strict separation is possible. So, okay, what does it mean? So, let there be an hyperplane which is strictly separating. So, H is a hyperplane set of all x such that A x, of course, it is not A is not 0, that it means that whole of R 2. So, if it is 0 and A is 0, then B is equal to 0, B must be 0, then basically is any x will do that. That's that's not the thing. A is not zero. Now, if you look at this, what does it mean? Maybe I should write it more. I should not write x because I have taken x here. So maybe I'll write z. So let this define. This this is this hyperplane. So what does it mean? It is strictly separating. So x is in the upper half space here. So a of x strictly bigger than B, while A of W is strictly less than B for all W element of C. That is the meaning of strict separation. You see here we have taken C 1 to be compact. If we take just C 1 to be a single point, then it is also compact. So, whatever we know about this result can be applied to this. Actually, one can prove this and then apply it to prove this will not do any proof here, uh, we are just giving an outline. See here the compactness of the set C 1 is very, very important, because if we do not have compactness, then we cannot guarantee a strict separation. So, consider these uh, two one is the lower half plane, which I call C 1 e to the power minus x right and then take the upper part now both sets are unbounded both are closed now you cannot find a strictly separating hyperplane if i draw this line for example there will be a time when it will come and cross this so, you cannot find a strict separation separating hyperplane, strict separation not possible. Okay. Uh, Now, 
once uh, this is known you might ask me then prove the Gordon's alternative theorem, but we will not prove the Gordon's alternative theorem, but refer you to this uh, small and nice book by B. D. Craven. is called control and optimization. published by Chapman and Hall I think it is way back in 1994, it is a very good book and gives a very nice proof of the Gordon's theorem of the alternative which they call the basic alternative theorem. Now uh, the question would be going back to the John conditions again. So, uh, we will now go back to A more simpler mode, a more traditional form of an optimization problem, where I will just talk about inequality constraints. In this case, we will get what is the what is called the famous Lagrange multiplier rule. And now let us let me assume in this case when because we need certain thing called implicit function theorem to derive a multiplier rule f not f 1 f 2 f m are continuously differentiable. So, we are now looking at a much more uh, different sort of problem instead of inequalities let us go back and look at to the traditional issue of inequality constraints. And first study some examples from inequality constraints and then try to get it because inequalities have one major point is that uh, they have uh, they have uh, the issue of complementary slackness condition and to satisfy inequalities and satisfying all these things are not so easy actually. Note now that if x star is a local minimum, then there exists lambda naught greater than or equal to 0 lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda m element of r means they are all free such that. So, here it is quite a simple rule of sorry x star. The most crucial point again is that the most crucial point as I again mention is this fact that this cannot be 0, the whole vector cannot be 0. So, this instead of calling it as a John multiplier, we will call it as a Lagrange multiplier. So, when you just have equality constraints, these are usually referred to as Lagrange multipliers. You have read about them in your calculus course, but of course, you did not know that you really had to show the existence of such lambdas. Now, 
Now, now what Lagrange multipliers are doing is that it converts the whole constant problem into an unconstant problem and then you are just taking the differentiation of the unconstant problem. This is the basic philosophy of solving any constant optimization problem. You really have to convert the constant problem into an unconstant problem and then solve it just like an unconstant one that is one without constants. Now, it is enough to know that this this problem it is enough to know just this fact. A similar way we if lambda naught is greater than 0 then Lagrange multiplier is normal if not we will call the Lagrange multiplier abnormal. Now, it is also important to remember when can we have a situation when there will be no abnormal multipliers. So, if this vector is linearly independent. then there is no abnormal multiplier. It is uh, very important to note here the following fact <coughs> that what what is the definition of an abnormal multiplier at lambda naught is 0. If lambda naught is 0 then from here it means I am 1 among lambda 1 lambda and m 1 among this at least has to be non 0. So, these vectors are linearly dependent. So, lambda naught equal to 0 would immediately imply linear dependence. So, lambda naught equal to 0 implies Linearly dependent, sorry, I think I should be proper. Now, the in, there is an interesting question. So, it means that if it is linearly independent and lambda would is not equal to 0, but see if it is linearly independent, I will never get a abnormal multiplier. The interesting question is okay, suppose I do have linear dependence that what does it mean? Does it mean that it will have a abnormal multiplier? The answer is actually no, it need not have an abnormal multiplier even if you have linear dependence. We will come to examples, 
we will come to we will use examples to demonstrate that that both a normal and an abnormal multiplier can be present. We note that given an x star these multipliers are not unique unless you guarantee linear independence. If there is linear independence then it is unique right. If there is no so if I leave that as a homework to you. Of course, if this is linearly independent then m must be less than n which is a very basic fact about uh, linear independence that the maximum number of linear independent vectors in R n is of course, n. Of course, these functions f not f i these are all functions from R n to R. If this m is linearly independent then there is a unique then the, there is a unique Lagrange multiplier then there is a unique Lagrange multiplier This is a homework for you. Unique Lagrange multiplier of this form. Because once lambda is not 0, I can divide it by this and I can get a new set of multipliers. So, <coughs> so this is a homework. Now, the question is this is quite a very uh, elegant simple did not have to write much no inequality constants. Suppose I have the inequality constant issue the problem can I use this idea to actually develop the Fritz John multiplier rule for inequality constant can I apply the Lagrange principle. So, what uh, I would like to show here just like uh, Jan Brinkwins and the great optimization theorist Vladimir Tikhomirov has shown in this book optimization insights and applications. I have already named this book, but I really want to show you this book. It is a Princeton University publication of 2005 and a very, very beautiful book. It it's gives a very beautiful insight into optimization, very deep insight I would say. And uh, what I would also like to note that uh, in this book they show that it is the Lagrange principle which is the guiding principle of all of optimization this Lagrange principle this one and that and lot of problems can be actually solved by using the Lagrange principle. Let us now try to develop the inequality constraint in the John multiplier rule let us make a trial through this Lagrange. So, now if I have I am making it less than 0. Now, once you do that remember I can always introduce what are called slack variables that is I can always in introduce non negative variables right which will make them non 0. But the bigger biggest problem that we will lie is that when you want to try to apply the Lagrange principle on this this sort of thing then what would, what would happen is the following. You, if you want to write this as an equality constant problem you have to write this as but S 1 is greater than equal to 0 to S m is. So, I have added m variables and added m constants also. Now, these are again inequality constant. So, the question is that I cannot try 
and write down if I want to use the Lagrange principle and try to write down the John multiplier rule it is really not possible. So, here we need to have a lot of geometry which is essentially related to sets given by inequality constraints. So, so that is why Fritz-Jones derivation of the whole thing was so, so important. Uh, it was a 1948 paper rejected by Duke published in uh, memoir volume celebrating the 60th birthday of Richard Courant of who, who is of course, a famous mathematician. In, in fact, John is a famous mathematician known in partial differential equations. Now, this uh, so this again needs some more uh, convex geometry or more geometry because again inequality constraints if, if you and if you change the functional constraints to equality inequality constraints have actually reappeared in form of the slack variables which must maintain non negativity to actually be a slack variable. So, this procedure cannot be done. So, now what is important is that we will take some examples and try to use the Lagrange principle. We will take these examples from Brinkwitz and Tikomirov so and try to apply and see what we can get. So, let us look at the first problem minimize f naught x, x 1 and x 2, sorry uh, minimize minus x 1 x 2 x, where x 1 and x 2 is in R 2 means. So, this is a problem in two dimensions. So, your f 1 f 1 x. So, it is a unit it is a circle of radius a and you are only expecting x i is strictly greater than 0 that is you want the problem to be here. So, once you basically want problem to be minimized over this. So, basically you are excluding you are taking the everything in the non negative orth and but you are excluding the points a 0 and 0 a does not matter. So, now once you do anything you you, are, you restrict your things to an in an open set then it does not matter the you will you will get back the Lagrange multiplier rule. How you get, would get back would need a lot of more deeper things which will not go into at this moment. Let us try to first learn how to apply the Lagrange multiplier rule and we will see that we are actually getting in most cases no the multiplier the lambda naught to be 1 whereas, we are getting uh, normal Lagrange multipliers. First case is to know the existence of a solution. See if I look at this problem from this point of view. If I consider this whole set and I uh, do not take uh, the fact that x i has to be strictly greater than 0, if I do not bother, then this on this, this set is a compact set, it is closed and bounded and over it you will have a minimum that is over a compact set a continuous function has a minimum. Now, here we are not putting a is equal a is not equal to 0. So, there will be a minimum somewhere here on this let us forget this extra condition I, I do not think that you really need to bother about this extra condition at this moment just take this problem. Now, the there will be a minimizer somewhere. So, the multiplier rule says that there would exist a lambda naught grad of f x star plus lambda 1 grad f x star f 1 x star to 0. 
Now, lambda naught this one would become grad of f x star is here and you minus x 2 star minus x 1 star plus and then lambda naught lambda 1 are not equal to 0. Assuming that there will be a we are, we are now sure about the existence of a solution because we are minimizing a continuous function over a compact set. So, once you are sure then we are telling that let x star be that minimum and then that would follow uh, the Lagrange multiplier rule and in fact it is a global minimum. If we take this one So, this would now amount to the following Well, lambda 1 does not have sign, so I can take minus lambda 1 also, it does not matter just for uh, easiness of the calculation. Okay, never mind. Uh, is equal to 0. And the other equation is lambda naught. So, if I say if lambda not I will now claim that lambda naught is not equal to 0. Now, if I uh, if I say if lambda naught is equal to 0 then from the above two equations it would imply that x 1 star is equal to 0 and x 2 star is equal to 0 because by Fritjohn condition sorry by the Lagrange multiplier rule lambda naught lambda 1 both cannot be 0 lambda 1 is 0. So, lambda 1 is not equal to 0. So, this will happen, but if this happens then it will mean a square is equal to 0, but I have taken a not equal to 0. So, I cannot uh, really take that I cannot really uh, get that I cannot have this to equal to 0 either. So, this in hence this would imply that a equal to 0 contradiction. Hence, it implies that lambda naught is equal to 1, we are just taking lambda naught equal to 1, sorry lambda 0, lambda 0 is equal to 1. So, then that what would it give me? So, let me just so lambda naught is 1, so minus x 2 star plus 2 lambda 1 x 1 star is 0 minus x 1 star plus 2 lambda 1 x 2 star is equal to 0. Now, we will eliminate the lambda 1 to get the results about. So, from here lambda 1 sorry from here we will get 2 lambda 1 x 1 star is x 2 star 2 lambda just a moment. 2 lambda 1 the first equation will give me 2 lambda 1 x 1 star is x 2 star and 2 lambda 1 x 2 star is x 1 star. So, lambda 1 is x 2 star by 2 x 1 star and lambda from here we also get from the second equation we get lambda 1 is x 1 star by 2 x 2 star. So, then this would imply that x 2 star by 2 x 1 star is equal to x 1 star by 2 x 2 star and this would finally imply that x 2 star is equal to 
uh, sorry x 1 x 2 star square is equal to x 1 star square. So, now these has to be feasible. So, which means x 1 star square plus x 2 star square is equal to this actually. Now, if I want that these are to be positive, we, we, we can have let us see, we can have positive, negative all, all those things. Now, if we really want that we will restrict it to the positive part, let us see what happens. Now, once you have this, what do you have? You have this as a square. Now, you will have 2 x 1 square as a square. So, x 1 star is plus minus root over a by 2. Similarly, x 2 star is equal to plus minus root over sorry uh, plus minus a by root 2 sorry calculation mistake a by root 2 a by root 2. Now, it you have to determine which will give you the minimum. Basically, if you take a positive and negative combination, then you will get a negative number. You will, you will get a you take x 1 start to be a by root 2, x 2 start to be minus a by root 2, right. So, you really have to see what are the points where the minimum is achieved on the circle. So, if you want only x 1 and x 2 to be both positive, then you will have to take x 1 star see what what you have to have to find the so f not x suppose if i take both negative then what what i'll get i'll get minus of a square by 2 if i take both positive then i'll get minus a square by 2 if i take one positive one negative then i'll get so as i take this positive and that negative so i'll I will get plus and minus would be minus and then there is a minus. So, I will get a square by 2. So, this is giving me the maximum value of minus x 1 x 2 and this is giving me the this is a smaller value. So, only when I have both positive or both negative. So, x 1 x 2 is this or x 1 star x 2 star is these are the points where the minimum is achieved. So, the two points where the minimum is achieved, because if you take uh, if you take a plus minus combination then you get a plus thing. So, that is a bigger bigger quantity than what you get and we know that a minimizer exists. So, among these uh, points for this four possible combination the we will get the minimizer. So, these are the two points where the we get the minimum value. So, these are the minimizers. So, minimizers must you know satisfy this all these Lagrange conditions and, and minimizer exists. So, the minimum value among these four critical points the objective the objective function value is minimum at which point we have to find that among these Lagrange model Lagrange points or points satisfying the Lagrange multiplier rule the form minimum value is obtained where the objective function is getting is uh, achieving the minimum value that is in this particular case. Right. So, sorry. So, this is an example and we will carry out some more uh, examples in more details in the next class. Thank you very much.